Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man wa ala amma ba'd This is our 88th lesson going through the book Umlatul Ahkam min kalami khayri al-anam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam author by Abdul Ghani al-Maqdisi rahimahullahu ta'ala Alhamdulillah, we completed Kitab al-Jihad and we now move on to the next chapter, Kitab al-Itq Al-Itq refers to the freeing of slaves and when we look at the Islamic period the slaves could be categorized into five types you could categorize slaves into how many types into five types the first type being what we call in the Arabic language Al-Qim i.e. Abdun Khalis he is completely a slave and so مثلاً, I go to the marketplace and I buy a slave and I own this slave completely that is the first type the second type is what they call Mudabbar Mudabbar is a slave that I own However, I say to the slave that when I pass away, you are free When I pass away, you are free And so his freedom hinges upon my death If I die, he becomes free The third is what they call Muba'ab Muba'ab is the slave who is half free Or a portion of him is already free and a portion of him is owned so he's not owned completely partially owned طيب, that's the third one the fourth one is the uh, mukatab and we came across this one previously in the case of Barira Barira anha and her family or her owners she had an agreement with them that I will pay you an uqiyya each year for nine years until it becomes nine uqiyya and when I pay you nine uqiyya I gain my freedom and so you have a contractual agreement with your master that when I pay you X amount, I become free. And the fifth one is Ummul Walad, Ummahat Al Awlat. And that is the milk yameen that the man has intercourse with and she becomes pregnant. So the master has intercourse with his uh, what we call Ummul Walad or Ummahat Al Walad, milk yameen, and she becomes pregnant. Just by her becoming pregnant, that son is free and when the man dies, the woman also becomes free. And so she was a right hand possession. She became pregnant from the master. That child is free. And the, the mother of that child, Ummahat al Awlad, she becomes free when the master passes away. And so these are the five cases of slaves that you may find in our religion. The ahadith that we're going to mention in this kitab will deal with two of these cases mainly the mudabbar and the uh, muba'av the mudabbar and the muba'av it doesn't necessarily deal with the other three cases and we'll deal with the other three cases in books of fiqh bi ta'ala Someone might ask what's the benefit of learning these ahkam? There's always benefit in learning ahkam fiqhiyya whether it's applied right now or it's not applied you might ask, we don't have these five types of slaves in our religion anymore or in the, the, the society that we live in right now, slavery has been abolished for 150 years or however, however many years has been abolished for now. The purpose of يعني, learning fiqh isn't necessarily to, what, to يعني, whether it's applicable or not. There are many chapters that we've come across that may be not applicable to us. A large amount of Kitab al we spoke about the agriculture I've never been to a farm in my life I've never been to a farm in my life however studying it is very important because you learn from it certain qawaid certain principles become clear and apparent which, can you, which you can then take out from this chapter which may not be relevant to you right now or may not be relevant to you but you take a qaida from it that you can apply into a very relevant chapter to the scenario which you are or to the society that you are living in today and so learning fiqh in a holistic manner in this fashion is something which is very important. How are you going to take away these ahadith? If you want to study Bukhari, Muslim, Buddha, or Tirmidhi, you're going to come across these ahadith. You have to understand it. You have to be able to contextualize it. You have to be able to extract from it benefits and qawaid, which you can then, qawaid usuliya, qawaid fiqhiyya, which you can then apply on other scenarios, in other cases, which could be of great importance for you later. And there may come a time when slavery comes back. But you, Remember these, these individuals who rule the world today, their morality is something which is not objective. You never know. Do you know Ibn al-Ghayb? No. There may come a time in 20 years or 30 years or 50 years where it might come back. You never know. 
How are you going to do with the ahkam if it was to come back? طيب. If you were to now just say, let's burn all the ahadith and burn all of the aqwal al-fiqhiyah uh, that speak about this chapter, what are you going to do when it comes back? Or what are you going to do when you want to yani, get a principle and that principle is found in this hadith and maybe not, or maybe found in this chapter that's not found in other chapters and you want and you didn't study this 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 uh, this bab طيب. or somebody comes and asks you questions or wants to know the rulings and you say no sorry i can't ask you i can't answer you because my sheikh never taught me it la yeah and it's something which is not good طيب. the faqih has to have knowledge of all of the chapters of fiqh he doesn't let one chapter go out because it's no longer yeah any relevant for his time or, or place طيب. That's not the way that the faqih functions. Wallahu alam. So the first hadith was on Abdullah ibn Umar. رضي الله عنهما أن الرسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من أعتق شركا له في عبد فكان له مال يبلو ثمن العبد قوم عليه قيمة عدل فأعطى شركاءه حصصهم وعتق عليه العبد وإلا فقد عتق عنه ما عتق. And so here this hadith explains to us the issue of the mubaghaf. So let's say me and Muhammad we go to the the, the, the marketplace where they sell slaves. And we buy a slave, I buy 50% of the slave, and he buys 50% of the slave. So I say the slave costs 10,000 pounds, I pay 5,000, he pays 5,000. We bring the slave back, and I now say, my part of the slave, the amount that I paid, the 5k that I paid, I say that this part of the slave is free. I freed him. I freed him. Of course now, this slave is not completely free, he's only half free. I've only freed my portion. I don't have any control of the other portion that belongs to Muhammad. And so when this happens, this slave now becomes Muba'ad. He falls into one of these categories. The third category, which is the category of Muba'ad. What happens in this case? What do we do? What we do in this case is, if the person who freed and said, my half, I free you. If he's rich enough to pay the £5,000 to Muhammad, i.e. We bought him for £10,000 in total, £5,000 from me, £5,000 from Muhammad. But I've now freed my portion. So in this person, this slave is now half free. There's still £5,000 that has been spent for the other half, which hasn't been freed yet. What I do now, as the person who freed my half, I say to Muhammad, I will pay you £5,000. Give me the slave entirely so I can free him completely. That's if I have the money to pay the 5,000 pounds. If I don't have the money to pay that 5,000 pounds, then that slave is considered muba'al. He remains muba'al. He remains half owned, half free. And so him and his master will come to an agreement and they'll say, مثلاً, you'll work one day and the whatever you earn from that day, that, that earning comes to me or is given to me. The next day you'll work again, whatever you earn remains with you and so on. Or it could be a weekly arrangement. However, Yani, uh, whatever agreement that they come up with, the slave and his uh, owner. Until the slave reaches, in terms of the wealth that he has accumulated, £5,000, which he can then give to me. Method, if I was poor and I didn't have £5,000 to pay to free the slave, i.e., that remaining half or that remaining 50% that he is still owned by this individual. But I don't have the money to pay off that £5,000 that, that he bought you for, or he bought your half for. And so you now, oh slave, have to work. Earn that £5,000, give it to me. I will pay that man, and you now become free completely. And I will get your, the wala'a. فَإِنَّ الْوَلَاءَ لِمَنْ أَعْتَقَ This is what's called the muba'ad. And this is how the muba'ad is dealt with. طيب. And that's what's meant by the hadith. As for the hadith that follows from that, وعن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من أعتق شقيصا من مملوك فعليه خلاصه في ماله فإن لم يكن له مال قوم المملوك في قوم المملوك قيمة عدل ثم استسعي غير مشكوك عليه. And so this is a, a, a the similar scenario that I gave to the previous hadith. We have me and Muhammad went to the slave market. We bought a slave for 10,000 pounds. I freed my half. He paid 5k. I paid 5k. I said, you are now free. So his half is now free. But there's still a half that remains. 
if I have the money to pay the five thousand pounds that this person Muhammad brought the slave for, i.e. his portion, I pay him the five k, I get the entire slave and I free him. And so the slave becomes free completely. So he's no longer a slave. And I get his wala. فَإِنَّ الْوَلَاءَ لِمَنْ أَعْتَقَ طيب. This hadith, the difference between it and the previous hadith is that this hadith, it is encouraging the slave to work. إِسْتُسْعِيَ He's encouraged to, to work. And here when we say شَقِيصًا شَقِيصًا أَعِي Someone who is half-owned or partially owned. وَعَفْ That's what it's meaning. طيب. And so we encourage the slave if I don't have the money, if I don't have the money to pay the five thousand pound to get this person's entire freedom, the slave should work. He should be encouraged to work. Not don't make it difficult upon him. Don't make it burdensome upon him. But get him to work. Get him to strive to get that five thousand pound, which he can then give to me, and I can give to this Muhammad, and so this now uh, individual becomes free. He becomes free, and he's no longer what mubaaf. He's no longer half owned or partially owned by Muhammad. And so this is the Muba'ad. طيب. As for the hadith of Jabir which follows, وعن جابر بن عبد الله رضي الله عنهما قال دبر رجل من الأنصار غلاما لا. And so this hadith, hadith of Muslim, it, 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 it shows us the category of al-mudabbar. Al-mudabbar is a slave that I own. And I say to him, when I die, you're free. When I die, you are free. And so this person's freedom is hinging, or is, it hinges upon my, my death. If I die, then this slave becomes free. But as long as I'm alive, this slave is still owned by, by me. What about a case where I am in the state of debt? And my debt reaches a level that I'm not able to pay back the debt. And this slave is part of my possession. Can the ruler or the qadi sell my slave? And this slave is mudabbar. This slave is mudabbar. I've promised the slave that when I die, he's free. But now I've entered into the state of debt. I've entered into the state of debt that I'm unable to pay back. Method, I've entered into a debt of 10,000 pounds. And the qimah, the value of that slave is 10,000 pounds. Can the qadi sell my slave who is mudabbar, even though he's in promised freedom after my death? Can I still sell him? Or can he be sold in order for me to finance my debts? The answer to the question is yes. And the report of Al-Bukhari makes that clear. وَفِي لَفْضٍ بَلَغَ النَّبِيَّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَى سَلَّمَ أَنَّ رَجُلًا مِنْ أَصْحَابِهِ أَعْتَقَ غُلَامًا عَنْ دُبُرٍ لَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ مَالٌ غَيْرُهُ فَبَاعَهُ بِثَمَانِ مِئَةِ دِرْهَمْ ثُمَّ أَرْسَلَ ثَمَنَهُ إِلَيْهِ So here the Messenger of Allah reached him that a man had a slave. And he said to his slave that when I die you are free. However he owns nothing but that slave. And he's in a state of debt. And so the Messenger of Allah took that slave and sold him for 800 dirhams. And then he gave the money to the owner of that slave to pay off his, his debts. And so this shows us the permissibility of a person to go back on his uh, uh, promise. He can go back on his promise in this scenario because of a necessity. And the necessity is what? That he has to pay back his debts. He has to pay back what he owes. And this is part of your wealth. And so even if you promise that person that he's going to be freed, after you pass away, that promise is no longer considered. Rather, you are to sell that slave, or that slave is to be sold, and the money which you get from that slave, you are to pay back those who you owe money. And so this is a very important concept when it comes to the mudabbar. And there are also issues pertaining to uh, al-qim, and issues pertaining to ummahat al-awlad. And as for the mukataba issue, we spoke about it in the hadith of barira, and we spoke about it there. And ummahat al-awlad, and the Mas'ala of Al-Qin, we will discuss it in its place in the books of Fiqh and other books of Hadith, bi ta'ala. With this, the author, Rahimahullah, concluded the chapter and concluded the entire book. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Nas'Allah tabarak wa ta'ala an nij'ala amalana hadha khalis an yawajih al-kareem. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who uh, are sincere in their actions and in their statements. الحمد لله الذي بنعمته تتم الصالحات We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to begin this book and go through this book and finish this book uh, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a tawfiq to continue on our path to study in the mutun of the hadith al-Nabiyyi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Alhamdulillah we've now completed umdatul ahkam 
min kalami khayr al-anam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, authored by the great Imam Abdul Ghani ibn Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi who died in the year 600 after the Hijrah. My advice to all talabat ilm, my advice to all students of knowledge is to continuously read this book. This book should be like an umdah, as its name. Its name is al-umdah fil ahkam. Tayyib, treat it as it is named. Annaha umdah. 400 hadith, memorize it. Kulluha fi sahihain. Apart from one or two, it's all in sahihain. All in one of the sahihain. Memorize it. And treat it as the umdah in your, in your uh, especially in your beginning studies of fiqh. As you study basic texts in fiqh al-shafi'iyyah, for example, the, the text that we're studying right now, Muhtasar al-Saghir, uh, Abu Shuja'a, uh, hopefully when we go into Safat al-Zubad, when we go into hopefully insha'Allah ta'ala, uh, Al-Minhaj, these, this book, Umdatul uh, Ahkam, along with Bulugh al-Maram, which we will continue with Allah ta'ala from now on, as you complete Umdatul Ahkam, Tayyip, studying these books side by side and together, it gives the person true malaka fiqhiyya, because he has an understanding of the masail fiqhiyya, al-mujarrada, without the dalil, and then he's also taking a dalil alongside it. And so he's not just sufficing himself with the madhab, nor is he just sufficing himself with the dalil, rather he's combining between the two sciences, and that is an ilm. Hada wallahu a'lam, subhanak allahumma bihamdik, ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته